We continue this morning our look at the brave new world of health. That includes promising new ways to prevent and treat cancer. Our Dr. David Agus, his new book is called The Lucky Years. Simon & Schuster Division of CBS is a publisher, but he writes this. One day, cancer will be a manageable condition, much in the way people can live with arthritis or type 1 diabetes. Dr. Agus leads the Westside Cancer Center at the University of Southern California. He is here along with Dr. Judy Garber, director of the Center for Cancer Genetics and Prevention at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Also, Anna Barker, former deputy director at the National Cancer Institute. We're pleased to have all of them here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let me begin with this point. 44 years ago, President Nixon declared a war on cancer. Where are we in that war? You know, I don't think we've won at all, and I think we're actually just at the beginning of the war in that for the first time ever, I can walk into a patient's room and have optimism. Not optimism, I can cure them, but optimism, I can make them live longer and better with this horrible disease. So what's changed? Well, we now have two kinds of therapy, precision medicine and immunotherapy that really are offering a staggering hope in this disease. And both of them, I think, are actually in practice. I know you all agree on that issue, Dr. Barker. I mean, how does immunotherapy work? It's helped Jimmy Carter, for instance. Uh, immunotherapy is actually an, an entirely different way of looking at and treating cancer. Uh, we, in years past, what we've done is target the cancer, cut it out, treat it with a toxic chemical, now, immunotherapy is allowing us to change an entire system, the immune system. So it's an entirely different way of treating cancer. It's been 40 years in the making, but we're there. We're seeing a lot of responses, durable responses in patients we've never seen before. How does it so work? So it's pretty exciting. How does it, really, it work? It works. It, it can work in many ways. Uh, it can work by turning on your lymphocytes or your, your immune cells. It can work by taking protective molecules off of cancer cells. Things called checkpoint inhibitors are very popular now. They're, they're so actually, cool. you know, cancers are born cool. with a don't eat me signal on them. And this yeah. blocks that don't eat me signal to allow the cells to come in and eat them. Yeah, well, we so all want this don't eat immune me system. signal. No. Now, Judy, you talk about the genetics. Angelina Jolie brought a lot of attention to the BRCA gene. So how much is inherited and, some, and how much is just bad luck? Well, I think it's a little bit of both for many people. So there are not very many people who have a strong gene like Angelina Jolie. But even those who do can be identified and target their energies on preventing those cancers, and we save lives for those people. For the rest of us who don't have those genes, all of our genes still have a role in balancing what we are exposed to and how we fight them ourselves. So our genes still are important. And finally, our cancers have their own versions of our genes. And that's where targeted therapies and precision medicines come, when you can understand part of the biology that's driving that tumor, those genes that are making it different, and target those things. Mm -hmm. But it's still such a, a scary thing. I'm going to get a mammogram on Friday, and it's always a very nerve-wracking thing. And when you yeah. look at the statistics where it says, every three minutes, two people in the U.S. die from cancer. Mm -hmm. And so when you hear the C word, you think, uh-oh, it's over. I don't understand, David, with all the brains that we have working on it and all the technology that we kill, still can't say we can cure it. Listen, I'm with you, um, and I'm with you. We have to approach it in a different way. Historically, you know, we've targeted the cancer cell, but I think we're seeing more and more we're actually trying to change the system. You know, to me, cancer is a verb, not a noun. You're cancering. Yeah. So my job isn't to target that cancer and kill the cell. It's to change you so the cancer doesn't want to grow. And it's a new way of approaching it that I hope will yield something. But you're right. We failed. My business hasn't done as well as it should have. But David, the one thing that we all underestimate is the heterogeneity of this disease. Every disease, there are similarities but mm -hmm. the cancers themselves can be different within an individual, mm -hmm. and the cancers between individuals can be quite different. So the challenge is figuring out how to treat every single patient and mm -hmm. target their changes in their gene, the genes that get translated. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, a very, it's, it's a huge challenge. You don't under, we don't underestimate the challenge. Well, we're looking at the possibility that, that some of the new therapies can attack a number of different cancers, not just yes. specific cancers. Correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're seeing, we're actually seeing what we call signatures. I mean, changes in the genes that look reproducible from one type of cancer to another. So in the future, it, it may very well be that your treatment for kidney cancer 
might be more effective if you have lung cancer to be treated with what you receive for kidney cancer. Mm -hmm. It's So we're just beginning to understand mm -hmm. these genomic changes in ways that will allow us to target that particular individual. I mean, you offer an anecdote about Steve Jobs in your book, who yeah. you treated. Mm -hmm. you know, Steve called it jumping lily pad to lily pad. As every time we sequence his cancer and identified a target, he was safe on a lily pad. But once the cancer progressed, he was swimming again in the pond. And so obviously, we want to find those lily pads. But what Ann said was really true, is that the 1840s, we started to categorize cancer by body part. And it hasn't changed since. So this new era, we're going to categorize them by on switches. And it really will be a new way. You're not going to have lung cancer. You'll have an EGFR signaling cancer or something of the kind. Mm. And let's talk about prevention. That's the thing that most people really should start focusing on. You say in your book, what you do early on in life affects what you do later in life. So what can we do when we think about prevention? Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot we can do. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, much of it is the basic things we've already known. Right. So yes. we would prevent cancer if we could get rid of cigarettes. Yeah, the environmental factors. The environmental factors, the lifestyle factors, the things you can control. Mm -hmm. If you can eat a healthy diet, exercise, try to take good care of yourself, and not smoke, you can reduce cancer risks by 40%. Wow. 40% mm -hmm. is huge. Then you're left with the, all those plays of chance and in trying to stay ahead. So that's what we talked about genetics. Some people will learn that they can prevent specific cancers they're at risk for. Mm -hmm. Others will have to play the healthy lifestyle game all their lives. You, Robin, you talked about early detection. Yeah. Early detection is still important. We do beat some cancers some cancers when we find yes. them early. Do you think, just quickly, do you agree with Dr. Agus about a, a baby aspirin every day? Yes, yeah. 100%. 100%. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and like for heart history. disease, too. It, yeah. It's a twofer. Yeah. You know, it was announced last yeah. night, advanced okay. prostate cancer, yeah. dramatic survival event is on baby aspirin. So it's real. Well, Salicylic good. acid. Validation again yes. for Dr. Yes. David Agus. Exactly. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much. What a really smart discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you.